Jeppe Strandsbjerg has joined me today to talk about his book chapter titled Freezing Cartographic Imaginaries, in which he discusses the reconnection of Greenland to Denmark within the context of European mapping and empire building. He does so by analyzing two maps of the coastline of Greenland and situating them in contemporary European map making and imperial practices. Before we delve into this interesting topic, I would like to ask you to tell me a bit more about your own background and how it is you came to write a chapter for a book centered around the theme of connectivity. That's a good question. And I think Louise is probably the one to, to really answer the question. <laughs> um, I, Louis contacted me uh, a few years ago where I had, I had actually left academia for a while and I was working with a small Danish publisher. Uh, but I had also written one of the few books, I believe, in international relations that really deal with cartography um, as a central topic. Um, and during my thesis, uh, my PhD, um, which I did at Sussex University, mm. um, I worked with the cartography and territory, sovereignty, these concepts. I was originally interested in identity and territory and space. And I became increasingly frustrated with the way territory and issues of space were discussed in international relations. Mm -hmm. And I think I just got more and more into the literature on cartography uh, and ended up focusing on that and how cartography establish, creates spatial realities that sort of conditions the way in which politics can be organized and is organized. Um, so I believe that Louis picked this up and was also interested in cartography and he asked me to join the group from there. Excellent. It sounds exactly what the book is about, so I think it's a good fit. Yeah. Very good. So I thought, at first I have to admit, I was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I was a bit skeptical about the notion of connectivity. I wasn't sure uh, how much it would actually add. Um, mm -hmm. I hadn't worked with a concept before explicitly. But as we, I mean, we discussed the topics of the books for quite a while before we started writing it. Uh, and as we got further into the discussion, and especially when I started writing the chapter, I actually got more and more enthusiastic about the, you know, the, the analytical uh, potential of the concept. And I think it fitted really well with uh, my own work in cartography, uh, both in terms of what is connected uh, in the map, but also how maps play a role in connecting uh, you know sites people um, mm -hmm. groups in different ways so i i got turned over if you can say that excellent I, I suppose it's always a bit tricky to get a good grip on a, a novel concept such as connectivity and to apply it to your research yes it was and uh, it, it's starting to make make more and more sense but as I said, really, when I started writing, I thought, I probably ought to, I want to be honest and say, I probably also, at one point, thought, okay, I don't have to read everything about the concept of connectivity. Let's just start using it and, you know, mm -hmm. try to get it into to the analysis of what to make. And I think it actually worked really, for me, at least, it worked well. I, I thought I, just, just, I could see that. I liked it. Yeah. Sounds a bit like a process of making it make sense. And, uh, yes. I, I think, think that can yeah. work. So, here's a quote from your chapter. The Norse Landnam in the 9th and 10th centuries can probably not be described as an empire from the outset, but rather a vast North Atlantic network of settlements, farms, towns, markets, courts, and so forth. Can you tell me about this Landnam and why the Norse settled in these places? And, and what were the factors that connected this network that, uh, that made up this polity, as you call it in your chapter? Yes, with the caveat that I'm not an expert in, in all the dynamics of, of Viking expansion, but there was a, you know, the Norse generally expanded and, you know, I mean, Vikings also play a special role in Danish historiography, were they bandits, were they murderers, were they peaceful, were they traders? Mm. I don't I don't know, and I don't want to go into the, all the details of why they expanded so, so vastly, I think more other people can say more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I think is interesting for the topic of the book is that the concept of taking land and settling in new places 
was uh, was central, and it's also an exercise that is usually deemed to be central in sort of in empire making. Uh, but this was a, an expansion into into new lands that was not that had not that was not sort of um, portrayed, represented, or aided by cartography. Mm -hmm. I think so we have a you know we have a we have a culture here or a, a mode of existence, a way of living that doesn't even have a word for maps or cartography in its language. So there's a different way here of organizing space, vast spaces along a long distance, uh, across long distances. Um, and I think that's really interesting for the topic that the book wants to explore. Um, and on the concept of why they settle in, in various places. I, d I don't know if there's a particular logic except for this is where they could get to because they settled in France, they settled in England, populated places where there were a lot of, you know, rivalry, there were, you know, there were plunders, there were, there were you know, there were combat, but they also settled in Iceland um, and in Greenland. And as far as I know, there were no encounters with the local population at first when the, when the North settlers came to Greenland. So there's not a particular uh, pattern in saying that they only settled in certain places and not in other places. Does that make sense? Yeah. That does make sense, yeah. And then uh, just the, 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 what were the factors that connected this network then? Because you, I think you make the comparison to uh, the Republic of Venice at some point in that it's not so much an empire as we think of it today, but it was a, a, it was a, a connected network, a, a polity, if you will. And what kept, uh, what kept the settlements together? across the, the North Atlantic? Um, a sense of mutual benefit. And I think it's also, it's a way of, you know, it was, it was a, I think there's a sense of community in a sense of trade and navigate, so, so navigation and, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and seafaring was the key to sort of, sort of connect these places. Um, and initially it was, in my understanding, a very unhierarchical relationship. So you didn't have a king in one place and a subordinate place in another mm. community elsewhere, but it was more based on, you know, you had, I think, I think autonomous communes, uh, autonomous mm. places. Then of course it, it was not powerless and it was not without power, but it wasn't an, a, you know, a formal hierarchical relationship either. Um, so it was very much based on connections over, over, over water, uh, sea-based, um, you know, communication or travel. Hmm. And I suppose also with these long distances between settlements and between the the seats of power and the the periphery, that that made it so the control can't be exercised as it would in the European mainland, uh, from power to the. No, no, I think that's another issue. I mean, I, I think even if when and all settlers in Greenland, for example, so, you know. Uh, and I was the king of Norway as a king. It was very limited what the Norwegian king could do mm -hmm. if the Greenlander settlers did not do what they were supposed to do. Um, but again, these sort of um, relationships were usually, as I've described in the, in the chapter, uh, based on mutual benefit mm -hmm. and mutual obligations rather than a hierarchical relationship between a subject and a king. So the king had to fulfill certain obligations in order to make to, in order to stay king for a particular community. Mm. Does it make sense? Yeah. It does make sense. And, and it leads me uh, to another question which I have. Uh, you mentioned earlier how the, the native Greenlanders or even the Norse settlers on Greenland didn't have much of a mapping tradition. And I was wondering, uh, what about the, the, the Inuit Greenlanders mapping practices and navigation techniques? Did their remoteness negate the territorialization of space through mapping? Uh, because obviously there's no need to claim sovereignty over land that no one is continue with, contending with you for, uh, no. as would traditionally be the case. So there's no need to signify on a map that to, to connect the sovereignty to the land, uh, if that makes sense. It does make sense, uh, but I think I think we also have to think of maps not only as uh, you know instruments of power, but also again of navigation of a, a, a you know a practice that 
mediates a relationship between people and land. And just as the uh, Norse settlers of the Vikings did not have a map tradition as we know it, nor did the Inuit, as far as I know. There's no evidence of it. Um, and it also makes sense if you look at the it makes sense if you look at the conditions in which they have lived or live uh, that there's no map tradition. I think uh, Claudia Porter, from uh, his associate professor in Canada, has have studied um, Inuit ways of, you know, navigating the landscape. Mm -hmm. And if you think of the landscape that um, that the Inuit have to operate in, it's very it's transitional. You know, yeah. uh, you know, ice moves. Uh, ice is quite the central feature of the landscape, especially in the winter. The coastline is rarely the same. It, you know, and the, if you walk across glacial ice, it's all, it also moves. So the notion that you have a steady land that can be mapped and fixed through mapping and claims, I think, is very absent. I'm sorry, it's very. Um, it's. I think it's. I think it's a, it's a strange idea, um, but again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an expert on you know Inuit ways of life. But there's no, there's no, uh, there's no historical trace of a map tradition, and also it makes sense that it's not a, not a map tradition. The only there's one map that is always being, if you know, being shown up and or picked up, um, and if you. If you Google uh, Inuit map making, you will see a copy of a wooden carved map uh, mm -hmm. that is basically a wood carving of coastlines um, that was given to a Danish captain in 1885, I believe. Uh, and there are different versions of the story. One is that Gustav Holm is the name of the expedition leader. He asked, he, need, he was given the map as a way of you know, showing him the right way to go. There's also a, a version of the story that it, that these maps were made for telling narratives. You know, I can show you the image of where I've been, but it's the only map of this kind, I believe, that exists. Um, I would I would have showed you one. I have a copy of it, but I think it's back home in Copenhagen, so I can't. Yeah. So, but basically, this is to say, um, I don't think there's a map tradition, and I don't think they needed one. Mm. Well, it, when you put it like that, it makes sense that they wouldn't need one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so then, finally, Greenland was mapped by the Danish, by the Norse settlers, by the mm -hmm. Europeans that arrived. And the mapping of Greenland made its way to the epistemic community of cartographers and chroniclers in Europe. Was it common for new cartographic knowledge to be immediately widely accepted? Or did contending views exist and persist? Hmm. That's a big question, uh, and I think you can you can answer it in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. And it also depends on where you look. Um, I think for this example, I think the key is that the small maps that I describe in the chapter that were made by the pilot mm -hmm. Paul, they were made in a way that was combinable with the emerging uh, cartographic epistem, if you like, in Europe, mm -hmm. right? So these maps were combinable with the existing cartographic knowledge. And therefore, yes, I think they were immediately acceptable. And from the historical records that I'm familiar with, the place names that Hall gave to the places he mapped. And it's also, it's, it's only very, you know, it's very large scale maps, so it's only a few, you know, Fioris in uh, on the west coast of Greenland where he traveled. These places may very quickly travel into uh, small scale uh, maps uh, showing Greenland or the North Atlantic. So yes, I think they were very quickly accepted and adopted into the European cartography. But I think, that, and I think if you look into some of the stuff that Lewis is dealing with in this chapter, you know, the, both the Spanish and the Portuguese courts had these master maps, mm -hmm. world maps in the making that where they were sort of including uh, new observations uh, from returning captains from from the Americas and yeah. other places in outside Europe, right? Sometimes these inf this information would probably clash with the other, you know, records and there could, of, of course, it can be contentious, right? Mm -hmm. But generally, if this, 
if these maps are made in a way that is combinable with the larger image you're trying to make, the larger map, yes, I think they were quite readily acceptable. And I suppose there was an awareness of the existence of Greenland for a long time. It, it, I think uh, when you look at some some very old maps from around that time, the general shape and, and location of Greenland is known. It is something that people are aware of. So I suppose that if someone were to come back after a journey and say, well, we made a map because we went there and this is how it looks like, there's no reason to, to question that, I suppose? Uh, no, so I don't think, so I think, the point is, um, also to follow up on the way you phrase your question, is that the, the maps that Hall brought back, they did not challenge, they did not challenge any conventions. Yeah. Uh, but again, there was not one, again, you know, there's not one connect, convention of what exactly Greenland looked like or what was indeed Greenland. Was it only the East Coast? Was it the West Coast? Was it mm -hmm. Southern Greenland? You know, you have different names. But there was a general idea that there was something there called Greenland and it was, and it took on an island shape. Um, but again, it wasn't until the turn of the century, uh, last century, that, you know, it was, that geographers agreed that Greenland was an island and was not connected to the North American continent. So, so, so yes, there's been a general agreement, uh, but also a lot of uncertainty to what it actually was and what Greenland exactly referred to. All right. I think that's quite clear. And uh, I think we have to end it there as we're... Okay hitting the time limit. So, yep. thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Uh, I thank hope you enjoyed it and hopefully until next time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, bye. Bye.